Hey everyone, it's Jessica from Stitch House. I'm trying something new. I hope you like these videos. Um, I'm not sure where they're going yet, but the whole point is to have fun and talk to cool people. And uh, that's what I plan on doing. So if you like this video uh, or you find something really interesting in it that you think you could share with somebody else, I hope you do. And uh, look forward to creating more things in the future. Thanks for watching. I've been trying to think of women that have always constantly reinvented themselves. And you are that woman in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I love if there is, I was trying to describe to Neil, my boyfriend, um, I was like, let me tell you a little bit about her. So think day trader meets, um, meets quilter, meets purple hair, meets marathon runner, kettlebell swinger. Uh, <laughs> what have I missed? What do you drink? Do you drink that. scotch again? Is that Excuse you're me? a scotch on the rocks girl? Are yes, you scotch, scotch on the rocks? Yep. Yep. <laughs> so I was trying to describe you and he goes, Wow, she seems like someone who's always kind of like kept it moving. I'm like, that's Paula. <laughs> yeah. I'm Paula Reed. And I grew up in New York, New York in Niagara Falls, but wound up in California for most of my life. Um, I started out actually in banking and then went into stock brokerage because I figured out stock brokers made a whole lot more money than people did when they worked in a bank. And I was a stock broker for, oh gosh, quite a few, quite a few years when I started quilting as a hobby. And the hobby sort of got away from me and I was doing more quilting and thinking about quilting than I was doing selling stocks. And so I went into quilting full time. I quilted for other people for probably about eight years and then started doing the teaching. And for the last 25 years of my career, I traveled 20 to 30 weeks a year teaching quilting to at shops like yours and guilds. And you were always my favorite. I have to tell you that. We won't tell my mom that. <laughs> always. My then the pandemic happened and I, and I retired four years sooner than I planned to. I had planned to, I'll be 75 in November, and I had planned to retire the end of this year. And pandemic and bam, no work. In fact, I was going to teach for you the day that that all came down. Do you remember? It was- I remember. That was a, everybody was like hating me that we canceled the Paula Reed event. <laughs> Actually, and you were the coming Dallas for the Dallas Quilt, Quilt Show. It was the Dallas yep. Quilt Show. I was in Dallas I Quilt Show. went on Thursday, February, uh, March 12th. I flew in and then found out Friday morning that the Dallas Quilt Show was canceled. So the weekend before that was the last time I taught. And man, it wow. was hard. It was like a crash landing. You know, 20 to 30 weeks a year traveling, and then all of a sudden, boom, I'm a full-time resident in my own house. Fortunately, my husband, <laughs> my husband, so oh, fabulous. I mean, every, everything was fine. I mean, that was that was just grounds for divorce right there. Oh my God, my wife's been gone for 30 weeks a year for 25 years and here she is, what do I do with her? And it worked out fine, you know, between us. But I had some mental health issues there because I was used totally. to traveling. I was used to working with my uh, sewing machine dealers and the stores and the guilds and the customers. I was used to flying everywhere. I mean, I... I I'd see a Southwest jet and just whimper. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I, I, I wondered, you know, I saw Rhonda at, um, I can't remember like VDTA and I said, how's Paula? And she goes, I think she really misses traveling. And I know you're so close to Rhonda and she, gosh, she, I should interview Rhonda too. Shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> she's it's another so cool lady. And, um, and what, but what I, a fabulous success story from a woman who started part-time at a sewing machine store with four little kids and wound up becoming the biggest Bernina dealer in America. She's in the top five with brother. I mean, yes, you need to interview her. She's amazing. But another equally like impressive woman, and she's like, I think Paula really misses traveling. I was like, I need to text her. I think I even text you maybe that night or something, but but when you text me after reading that newsletter, I was, it was like such perfect timing. Cause I was like, who is someone that like, I know you've said mental health, but like, you've always kind of just 
rolled with whatever's going on, it seems like, because you yeah. have done so many different things. And someone that does so many different things is not someone that's complacent or okay with, you know, keeping things status quo. Like you've always rocked the boat a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, in fact, I just flew home like yesterday. I did, a, I did a half marathon on Sunday at Disney World and then flew home last night. And then I have, I have and did you say, yeah, in two weeks. So. Uh, well, I was wondering when you were telling me all this, because we were trying to find the timing for this. I was like, wait a second. Is she doing the knee surgery after she runs the half marathon? Absolutely. You can't do it before. <laughs> they won't let you do it on crutches. <laughs> I, I had so, a call at um, one of Alex Anderson's retreats last September. And you know those rolling chairs? Well, we, I was in a hotel, you know, the th things in a hotel, and we were packing up uh -huh. the car. So I was kind of running behind the rolling chair, and the flooring changed, and the chair stopped, and I didn't. Oh, no. Yes. Yeah, so I tore my meniscus. So I'm having that fixed. Okay, well, they'll be able to fix that. Yeah, they'll it's fix an easy... that. You're still running half marathons. Yeah. <laughs> I walked most of I can't I, handle you. Honest. Because the knee hurt. Well, whatever. And, yeah, but whatever, I did. Whatever, you it. still finished. I got the yeah. medal. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, that's you all are. Have you ever seen the Disney medals? So... They're awesome. Okay, so I've heard your story, but can you tell people how you got into quilting? Because it's hilarious, and I think everybody should hear it. And I love the story. <laughs> It is kind of a fun story. It was actually my husband's fault. You know that because yeah. um, one of my friends, you know, was a quilter. And so I would hang out in her sewing room or, you know, among other things that we did, you know, I'd hang out in her sewing room, watch her, you know, put all these things together, not really understanding what she was doing. But one day we decided we were going to go to a quilt show. So she grabbed her husband, I grabbed mine, and we go to this quilt show. So Mary and I go and look at the quilts. And Dan and Steve go off and do who knows what, right? So we're looking at the quilts and I'm not really understanding what I'm looking at. Because if you're not a quilter, you don't understand the labor and everything else that goes into it. So I'm I'm going along, oh, this one's pretty, that one's not, you know. And I'm through a whole row and I look back and for Mary and she's back still leaning in, looking at every stitch like on the third quilt. So I'm like, out of my mind. I'm so bored. And we're in there an hour and a half looking at these quilts. And I'm, you know, I just, I just want to scream or bite somebody's ankle or something. And we finally get out of the quilt viewing area. And my husband runs up to me and, you know, my husband's 13 years younger than I am. So he had like way more enthusiasm than I did at that point. And so way more energy, right? So he comes running up to me with this great big bag. And in this bag was a rotary cutting mat and a rotary cutter and a six by 24 inch ruler. He said, honey, you were in there so long. I know you're going to love this. <laughs> and, <yeah. laughs> and I just kind of looked at him, you know, and okay, okay, you know, I, you know, you thank him, you pat him on the head, you know, and so. About he tried. Three, yeah, yeah. He, he really did try. And I put this in my in my sewing room because I did have a sewing machine. I had an old Sears Kenmore machine that um, was in the closet in the guest room. I'd had it since college because my mother just wanted to get rid of it. And I just carted it around with me everywhere I went. So it was in the guest room, so guest room closet. Never been serviced, nothing. So one day I'm on my way to work and I open my uh, trunk and I throw in my purse and I throw in my briefcase because I was a stockbroker at the time. Um, and I threw in my car keys and slammed the trunk shut. You know, what are you going to do? You can't go anywhere. You know, where we were living at the time, AAA would have taken an hour and a half to get to me. My husband already left for work. He had the other set of keys. So I go back in the go back in uh, my house and I call my secretary and tell her, you know, page me if there's an important emergency. And I sat down, had my 18th cup of coffee and I'm thinking, what am I going to do today? And I said, I know I'll make a quilt. I had scrap fabrics, 
bear with me here. I had scrap fabrics. I got out that old Sears Kenmore machine. Took me probably 40 minutes to figure out how to thread the damn thing. And started, <laughs> started making this quilt. Cut, you know, cut the pieces with the new stuff my husband bought me. And I actually did make a quilt that day. So here it is. Oh my gosh, I love this quilt. I've seen this. <laughs> it's it's, so, oh my gosh. It, it's, it's awesome. Old, and, you know, but it's my first quilt. And I love it. I love it. I just love it. It's so fun. I love it. So then I made that one quilt. And so, okay. And then started making more. And then, you know, life took off from there. <laughs> How did you, I, I don't think I know this part of the story. How did you get involved with, like, you have DVDs and your own product line. Like, you were way ahead of your time on any of that stuff. How did, how did that all start for you? We had some friends who used to live here, and they now live in Chicago. And they own a company called Lighten Up Technologies. And David does all sorts of different things in the sewing world. You know, he makes the Quilters Cruise Control. And they were doing educational videos on the cruise control. And he said, you know, you really need some videos. And so he he um, did all the camera work. He did all the editing and everything. I just flew to Chicago. They We got set up and I did the recording. And very easy to work with. And so you're right. Nobody had DVDs then. Nobody. And so it was really cool that I was able able to do that at a time when it was really needed because you can't be everywhere. And then I also, I don't know if a lot of people even remember this. I still have craftsy classes, you know, on. Oh on yes. Craft. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of those. So that's, that's good too. You know, ways to reach people without actually having to go anywhere. Although the going everywhere was what yeah. I liked the best. I know that's part of the conundrum I find myself in because I found myself, you know what? I didn't really know where I was going to go with this, Paula. And then I kind of found myself thinking like, there's so many, the sewing industry is cool because as much as there's a lot of men that own stores, there's a lot of really impressive women in this industry that have mm -hmm. done really cool things for themselves. And um, like, what other industry do we have so many like women entrepreneurs and people, you know, going out and teaching their own courses and education. And like, it's a cool industry of some really impressive people. You know, my mom being one of them, you Rhonda, yeah. Alex, like, like so many different people that, that uh, like, we need to like get these stories out there a little bit more, you know, really, there's a lot I of women, you know what I mean? Well, this is an industry where women can s certainly excel. You know, I mean, there's some great men quilters, but so many fabulous women quilters. And the new up and coming group of quilters is so phenomenal, too. I love the whole modern quilt movement. Um, I'm very enamored of that and have made a lot of modern quilts. Probably, I think that modern quilts are a natural place for me to gravitate toward because of all the negative space for the quilting, because the quilting is a part that I love. Totally. I'm a good piecer, but so quilting, quilting is really my you thing. You love to quilt. Love You're, it. You, I always tell people, um, do you remember that show we worked in Modesto um, and like no one came to it? And um, <laughs> do you remember that? Yes. And I remember- With my, my mom's own. store? Oh, I remember- Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and that is where I'm really good at doing pebbles because there was no one that came and I sat down on that uh, machine and I did pebbles and you were showing me like the process. So to, to this day, the only thing I can demonstrate free motion wise is pebbles. And I always say, Paula Reed taught me this at a Modesto <laughs> quilt show one day. <laughs> and they're like, you're really good at those. I'm like, it's all I got. Like, don't, it's all I got. <laughs> don't yep. ask me to do a feather. You can do, it. Nothing. You can do the pebble. <laughs> I could, I can pebble and I can pebble like a queen because <laughs> you taught me. <laughs> um, but, but my point was that like, um, okay. So, so I always wonder like, okay, so you meet these people, they're like, you need a DVD and you just say yes. Pretty like much. you had no hesitation on that. There was no, you had no reservations. Like you just, you just said, no. okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I could write. 
book, but a video for me was easy. I really, like my second one, Borders and Bindings, we didn't even plan that one. You know, I was planning to do my second free motion quilting one, you know, because my first one was the basics of quilting, you know, fluff and stuff. And then my second one was going to be the one beyond the basics, you know, that had all the free motion, uh, more advanced work on it. And Alex and I were talking one day and she said, you know, you really need to do a video on borders and bindings. And I said, why? You know, I'm like whining at this point. And she said, because if you're going to bitch so much about the way I put my borders on, you better be willing to teach people how to do it correctly. So instead of doing <laughs> Beyond the Basics, <laughs> love Alex. Borders, and I already had my film crew scheduled for the other one. And so there was absolutely no prep for borders and bindings. We did it downstairs in my house. We had like the ironing board and the cutting stations were in the kitchen and everything else we did on the on the dining room table. I mean, it, no, no pre-planning. And actually, it outsold my first one for probably a year. So evidently, it was knowledge wow. that people. And then I went back in about a year later and made Beyond the Basics. But it was Alex's fault. I mean, I whined and kicked and screamed all the way through it. But. It was evidently a product that people really wanted. So no, I had no hesitation making the videos. When did you introduce your bat scooters? Good question. And your bat snips. Like when did you start introducing the product? Did the DVDs come first? Yeah, the DVDs came first, then the bat scooters. And actually David helped me design those and, and he still does all the laser cutting and everything, even though you know Terry Lucas really? bought company right you knew about terry um but yes. david still does all of that and he helped me design them because i wanted them a bat shape so it was it was fun to that. do yeah and so, they work so then you they really work well. they work yeah yeah so you had the bat scooters the bat snips you're teaching you've got dvds and you're doing a ton of stuff, uh, like even with Westerly Rulers and stuff like that, uh, different companies, right? Mettler, right. Westerly. Yeah. I, and then I the pandemic, with, so. Yeah. I worked with both Mettler, Mettler and Westerly. Mettler, I, st I became their uh, representative, not a representative in that, a sales rep, but I was the face of Mettler from 2012 until 2020. So all of their commercials, mainly that aired in Europe, um, they were commercials that I made for them. And then and you uh, were working with Brother at one point, right? Yes, I worked with Brother quite closely for for a few years there. You know, I worked with Bernina first, <laughs> but then I had also I had always taught all different brands because I felt that to come into a guild particularly a guild more than a store, because a store, you're going to teach the brand that the store sells. But in a guild, if you are a brand ambassador for Bernina and somebody brings in a Viking or a brother or something else, what are you going to do? Say, no, I'm not going to help you. You know, so yeah. I made it my business to learn all the brands. And Rondo actually introduced me to the vice president of sales with Brother. And then I started working with Brother as well. So, and then so steady, the rulers so, I with them in 2015, when the rulers first came to the U S and it just made yeah. quilting simpler for a lot of people, you know, especially if you didn't like you to just, I think the coolest thing about you, Paula, is that, um, like, um, and you, and I don't know how you feel about this because like some people say this about me and then I'm like, Ooh, I don't feel that way. You just <laughs> have like this confidence, <laughs> you know, you know, when other people say it, you're like, okay, cool. But then you, when you say it, it's like, do you believe it about yourself? Right? Like you just right. have this confidence about you. That's so cool that like, I feel like when I'm around you, you like, you know, exactly what you want to do. You know, exactly what you're doing. You're, you you fit your, you have no hesitation to things. And I, I just like, I, it's so admirable when uh, <laughs> I'm around you. Cause it's like, even when you're talking about, you're like, yeah. And then we did this and then we did this and this is yep. just how it worked. <laughs> and, uh, so what are you doing now? Like what's, what's next for you? Like, I know you, you're doing like all this, like half marathons. You've always liked to be like really active. Like, like you said, you were at a retreat with Alex. Like, what do you, are you still in the sewing industry? Are you doing things like what's going on? I was at the retreat as a student and I as a student, you get to yes. be a student now. 
I had taught that retreat with her from 2001 to 2010. And so, you know, for 10 years, I taught it side by side with her. And then she started bringing in other teachers. I started doing other things. You know, our, our calendars weren't matching up well anymore. And so um, we just kind of went in our different ways. And then I decided to come back as a student. And oh, my gosh, it was fun. <laughs> really? I can't, I can't imagine. I'd be like in the class, I'd be like, you know who that is? <laughs> She's going to show us all up. <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, it's fun to just sit and sew and not be teaching and not having people asking questions, you know, just being able to sit and sew for a week. It was great. So, okay. You've done so much. Um, part of this series is like, the, the, so the girl I interviewed before, Paula, she, um, her name's Anna Claire. She's really cool. She started an embroidery business during COVID and has really done oh. really well for herself. Um, and so I'm kind of like, in, uh, unintentionally, this is just kind of like the people that I've picked. I've picked people that like inspire me and that I know are like inspiring women. So, and in business and I've been in business for themselves and I've done some cool things. So, so what is your advice um, to women that are maybe looking for something for themselves or something for, um, to start a business or, or, or go for something that they've never thought was probably, um, possible for them. Say yes. Say yes a lot. Because I think that our first instinct when we're going into business for ourselves is fear. You know, we're afraid, <clears throat> excuse me, we're afraid we're not going to make it. We're afraid we're going to make a mistake. And I found myself meeting, the right people were sent to me at the right time, you know, for me to help. Um, I was just sitting at home uh, sewing and I had just started a pattern line. And this was in 1993, because I started my business right around then. And I just started a pattern line. And who, do, who is the first person I meet when I go to quilt market is Alex Anderson. And I became her quilter and I was her quilter for years, taught with her. I mean, Alex gave me that hand up I needed. And had I said no to her when she asked me to quilt for her because I wasn't confident enough in my abilities. If I'd said no to her, um, I'm not comfortable with being on film, so I don't want to be on Simply Quilts with you. I mean, there were many, many times in my path where people made offers to me and I could have said no because I didn't have enough confidence in myself or because I was afraid of it. Was I afraid of it the first couple of times I went on Simply Quilts? Yes. I was afraid of making a mistake. I was afraid of, um, you know, making an idiot of myself. I'm probably the only person ever to be chewed out on Simply Quilts for leaving my rotary blade open. You know? <laughs> 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 you know? So, <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of a lot of ways I could have said to D to David, "No, I I can't do a DVD, or I can't, you know." Does bat scooters, you know, he wanted to call them bat buddies. I go, no, 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 no. But, you know, but there were just a number of, pl of places where I could have backed away. And instead I was intrigued. And I think one of my gifts is that I'm curious. I'm curious to see if I do totally. this, where will it take me? So say yes. Absolutely. And, and it feels like you don't, and I think I've talked to you about this. You don't, you don't even use age as an excuse for anything <laughs> like never running a half marathon on a torn meniscus never will never will nope you know i'll be 75 this totally. year i can't believe it you know i started the business really young and um and i think that's my biggest advantage is that i i took a leap really early in life and i'm trying mm -hmm. to find um what my next passion is like you know, it's not that owning a business is not my passion. It's totally my passion. But I've also found like this big um, sense of like purpose and helping other people with finding their confidence, whether it's starting a new hobby or starting a business, like an embroidery mm -hmm. business um, or a quilting business, you know, long arm business. Uh, there's so many different ways to either supplement income or completely you know, get rid of that like full time job and start something new with with sewing. And so well, I, I think that 
in the position of life coach. Seriously. Oh, no, I'm not a life coach. No, you I need are. a life coach. Encourage <laughs> our businesses and to be able to quit that nine to five. You're influencing the direction of their lives. That's a life coach. And you have a passion for that. Well, I totally do. But, but it's been a lot of trial and error, Paula. I mean, I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, but I think I, very similar to you, I just say yes to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, in my head, it's like, I, I, I don't really have a fear of failure because it's like, all right, well, but we'll try again. Like, that's just a lesson, right? Um, you know, if you fail, it's like, well, learn from that. What did we do wrong? How do I fix that? You know, um, I, I more so have a fear of like, what if I don't do something and then somebody else does it before me, you know? I agree. And you've had Rookie of the Year with different companies. You've grown your business. Didn't you make President's Club the first year you were a Bernina dealer? The first year I was a brother dealer out of a 2,000 square foot store. I was in the, um, I was in a helicopter with uh, Jeff Bray, uh, Paul LaPonte, and George Moore oh <laughs> oh, flying over New Zealand. <laughs> I you keep. <laughs> It was an interesting time. Um, but, you know, something I've always fought and continue to fight is that I'm young and uh, I'm a I'm a woman. And, yep. you know, it's you still get the pat on the head sometimes and you take it right. You're like, oh, OK, but then you like then that kind of like fuels me. And then I'm like, I'm not the little girl, <laughs> you know, like I want when I'm I was to show that. Right. Thing. You know, when I was a stockbroker, I kept expecting discrimination because I was a woman. I wasn't getting it. I was getting this. I was getting more comments because of my age. I was only 30 when I became a stockbroker. And for a man, that's not young. But for a woman, it was considered very young. And so I had to fight that totally. more than my daughter. Yeah, it, more than being a woman, it's it's definitely the age and especially in the industry um, you know, there, a lot of the people that own stores around me or even my customers, they're older. And, and sometimes yeah. they look at me like, like, who's the owner of the store? And I'm like, it's me, <laughs> you know, and, and <laughs> I've had to yeah. learn how to hold myself with some confidence in that 20,000 square foot store and say, Hey, this is how things are. And this is how things are going to be. So, uh, you know, I've had to learn how to, to grow up a little bit <laughs> moving into that big location. Um, Step you, did, have you not seen my big location? Oh yeah. I've taught in your big location. Remember when we had, weren't you in your new location when we had all those Q20s in and Holly oh, came? Oh, that's right. That's right. We did you know Holly passed away by the way? Yeah. So I was sad. so sad. So sad. I really liked her. She was, I loved Holly. Mm -hmm. Talk about a woman that just like was another strong personality that was so cool. I loved Holly so much. She was, she was awesome. Um, well, is there anything you want anybody to know about you um, or anything you want to say before we end it and send it off to an editor to make it look good? <laughs> yeah. I would like to give a message or talk a little bit about preparing for retirement. Because a lot of our customers that. are in that age group, you know, and I wish mm -hmm. I had been able to prepare for my retirement because my retirement coming is such an abrupt shock to me, caused me quite a bit of, of pain and anguish. And it was probably two years before I was able to get past that. If I had been able to prepare, it would have been a totally different experience than just hitting that brick wall. Boom. Job's over. So what, what kind of preparation, like, what are you talking about when you say that? You know, financial was not my issue. It was emotional. Emotional. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can plan for your retirement, you know, so you can wind it down. Like, ideally, I would have traveled to my favorite dealers for a year and done kind of a farewell tour, you know, me and Elton John, right? But I didn't get the opportunity to do that. So... It's, mm -hmm. I think people think, oh, when you, they retire, they're going to have all this time and life is going to be wonderful. If you don't have things to fill that time, life is not wonderful. You have to start. So you've been, 
you've been filling your time with like what you've been going to retreats as a student running what else so most of the day I read in the evening you know I've kind of got a routine going now I've got more quilts done than I've ever been able to do before but when I first had all that time I didn't really know how to fill it I was sewing but I didn't have goals now I have goals of what you know what I want to get done uh, I just wasn't emotionally prepared financially everything's fine but emotionally I really needed time to prepare for that. So if you're nearing retirement age or even within 10 years of retirement age, start piling up ideas about what you want to do when you've got the time to do it, you know, and I think that would make a big difference. It would have made a big difference for me because I would have been ready. I would have had a plan and I had no plan because I wasn't going to We see a lot of people. For years. Well, we see, you know, we see a ton of people and I know you've heard it in your class that are getting ready to retire. And so they're looking to buy a sewing machine because they're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And as a 30 something year old, that doesn't sound as scary to hear. It's like, Oh, what do you, I'm like jealous. Right. I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know what you're going to (laughs) do. Right. Uh Right. But, but I have, um, because of the uh, industry and being around older people, most of my life, I actually understand what you say when you say that Paula, because you Good. find a lot of your identity in in what you were doing. And uh-huh. when all of a sudden that's that's stripped away from you really fast, it, it would be like anything, you know, like now now what's your identity and, and how do you find that fulfillment and joy? And that's anything in life, right? Whether it's retirement or, you know, starting a business or having a child or whatever it is, right? The, like if, if something is all of a sudden not there anymore, right. now now what? Well, actually, a friend of mine who's a retirement coach or a uh, running coach, actually, um, she and I went to a running camp together hosted by a, by an Olymp- a former Olympian, and uh, which was amazing. But she said, basically, she said, you're grieving. And I said, yes, totally. You know, I, I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but I was grieving the loss of my of my job. And it took me a couple of yeah. years to get through it. Where if I'd had a plan, it wouldn't have. So that would be my, that would be something I'd like to address to people, to the people in the age group that I was teaching pretty much. Totally. I, and I see that all the time in the store. And sometimes like, you know, people are buying things, buying sewing machines or buying, buying fabric or whatever, just trying to like fill that happiness. And I think that's one of the things that I've tried to identify at Stitch House and with stores, like, you know, more than, more than anything, I want Stitch House to be like a community of people because I I know that there are a lot of people either grieving, maybe they had to retire, maybe they lost their husband, maybe they, you know, are, you know, moved to a new city to take care of grandkids and don't know anybody. There's a lot of people that find sewing because Mm -hmm. of a loss of something and um, they, they do it because it's very therapeutic. Yeah. I didn't think of that. What did you say? I didn't think of that, but you're so, I, so many life circumstances. I think if COVID showed us anything, uh, it's that we need other people. Um, and when we don't have that community and we don't have those other people, uh, you know, life life is not as as fun as it could be or as good so, as it should be. And we need other people. Yeah, it's not as fulfilling for sure. Totally. You know, I, so I can see what you mean. I miss going to your mom's, you know, I still go to Rhonda's. I don't teach there, but I still go, you know, I bought a luminaire I'm and I've call- started embroidering, you know, you I never thought that, you right? I, I've embroidered a few Are things. You, I've, I've made some you Kimber even Bell dare pillows. use my design center for embroidery, for quilting? Um, I haven't tried that. You know, I've made some Kimber <laughs> Bell pillows, all hanging and some things like that and really had fun with it you know did one of the tiled OES of things and the embroidery was easy putting them together was a little tricky but <laughs> but what's so cool you is need a little... trimmer by george a trimmer by do you oh, have one by... <laughs> no i don't so so when you when you're putting those tile scenes together the trimmer by george and i don't know who george is but it pulls away your fabric and allows you to just cut that stabilizer out of your tiling seams. It's got this cool thing. I'll send you a link. 
And okay. then when you put it together, there's less bulk in the seam. So the seams go to no. together better. Okay. I want that. You, Definitely. You need a trimmer by George. But I, <laughs> I but, can't believe no one's told you this. Yeah. But I like the tiling. I like the designs. I and love the, the tiling with, scene. You know, with the Luminaire, the embroidery is so easy because if there's a problem, like a thread breaks or you run out of bobbin or whatever, it is so easy to get back to where you were. And that's what I was always afraid of with embroidery. Okay, my thread's going to break and the whole piece is lost because I don't know how I will ever, you know. And the Luminaire just makes it so, so, so easy. I am so glad I bought it. Well, okay, Paula, I'm going to wrap it up because... You're amazing. Um, tell Dan I say hi and thank you for uh, <laughs> lending me you for a little bit. <laughs> and let me know. Um, will you text me? And work a show with you because I will do that. Oh my gosh, I would love that. I think the OSQE show maybe at the end of the year because I don't have anybody and, and it's all quilting. Yep, let's talk. I'd love to. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you, Paula, so much. I love you so much. Thank you for coming on. Seriously. <laughs> Babe, take care. Thanks, Paula. Bye. Bye.